guess I shouldn't have started streaming it while I was up there moving it. Remember next time not to do that. All right, so let me open something. See if they make me do that. Nope. Okay, so we finished up the uh, Acanthobothria. So that was you know, three body forms. They have a large attachment organ, large ventral sucker, uh, also called an opus thapter. All right. We have uh, our, our example that we used was Lobatostoma mantari. Open that up. And let me zoom in on this. That. All right, Lobatostoma mantari. This is 1973 is when it was published, uh, when they first identified that 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 parasite. Um, and it wasn't just identification; they also looked at development in snails. So, what does it look like? This is it. Let me rotate it around. This is it. These are the stages that develop in the snail. And this is their length. So the maximum size is seven millimeters, which really isn't a whole lot. All right. But you get to this stage where uh, you have your, your gonads and stuff, but you're just not producing eggs. So I wanted to show you what Lobatostoma look like. Um, the other thing is the host. Right? And we have to be careful. Uh, because there is a fish called the snub-nosed darter. But we're dealing with the snub-nosed dart. And this is what it looks like. Uh, kind of varies in size, but these guys are specialists on those snails, so it kind of starts to make sense why this parasite is associated with this host. Basically a trophically transmitted parasite. All right, so I wanted to show that to you. We don't have specimens in the lab uh, to look at, unfortunately, but uh, I always think it's a good idea to look at at the worms or diagrams that you have a, have a picture of, of what they what they are, what they look like. All right, questions. The spit of Othrian, that quiz is posted. I have made it due on Tuesday night. Uh, this does this does have your start of your life cycles. So with our life cycles, we need to we basically need to know our life cycle. We need to know what hosts it's in, the name of the stages that are in those hosts, where they're found in the host, and then how they transmit between the hosts. All right. So there's going to be a lot of things um, as part of our exam. Uh, I'm thinking we're going to probably do like multiple choice for a decent part of it because um, we can kind of ask more questions to assess broader knowledge. And then we're going to transition to life cycles. You'll have your choice of life cycle to draw, all right? And those are worth 10 points each. So some of them are really simple. Uh, and if they're a simple life cycle, then you'll have your choice of two life cycles that are simple, all right? So like the Acanthobothrium, that's pretty simple. If we have a life cycle that, let's say, schistosoma that is, has a lot of migration, tissue migration, it's a pretty long life cycle. Then your other option will also be a pretty long life cycle. All right. This type of information is also uh, going to be assessed somewhat in the lab, where I ask you, what is this parasite, or where might we, you know, where could what in what host could we find this parasite? So there's a lot of overlap with it. And I think what I've seen since we do the lab practical after the lecture exam, sometimes students finish up that lecture exam and say, man, I just really wasn't sure about my life cycles. And then they do better on some of those questions in the lab. All right. So that was the spit of Othrian. Uh, I wish we had samples, but we don't. So we're going to move ahead. Uh, we are still in the five. Yep. I'm, I'm just like some clarification. So the base is like the three body forms 
are they just different modified variances that like, result in two different models? Yeah. So normally the, I already closed it, the one with the uh, locula and septa, that's traditionally been called the Bayer's disc. You're going to see that used a lot. Uh, technically, I think the Bayer's disc could be modified into these various structures. So the other body forms would also have a Bayer's disc. But when we talk about Bayer's disc, classically, it's always going to be like the one with lobatostoma. It's got these locula and it has these septa. All right. All right. And don't, I should say, don't think multiple choice is just words. I might put up diagrams or drawings and say, what, what body form is this? All right. So don't think it's just, it's just going to be words. All right. So we're still in the potty helmet. These, any other questions? Good questions. And again, I'll say, if you have questions, we start class with questions. Ask them. If you have that question, somebody else may have the same question. Or if you prefer not to ask it in class, email me. And if I think it's important enough to say, I'll bring it up in class, but I won't say who asked it. In case you're afraid of being embarrassed. All right. So we're in the class Trematoda. Subclass Digenea. So we were in the subclass of Spinobothria, now we're in the Digenea. All right. Let me see here. Uh, okay, hold on. Let me send out an email because we should have a student that is attending virtually. I apologize. Let us get this link. Copy. There we go. All right, Digenea. Why is it called Digenea? Any guesses? Two gen genre? Yeah. Have you looked ahead in the lab? No. <laughs> Has anyone looked ahead in the lab? It's a good guess. We have, we're going to cover several genre. <laughs> several genre. Genre, genus, isn't the correct term for this. Generations is. So we're going to have not necessarily two generations in the sense that we did of Think of a generation, but we're going to have two cycles of reproduction. We're going to have a sexual reproductive phase, and then we're going to have an asexual reproduction stage. All right, so hence the digenea. All right, two generations. So most of these are endoparasitic. Usually they're going to be found in the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So in the intestines, could extend to the stomach or the esophagus or the proventriculus, depending on or the uh, abomasum, depending on what you know, organism we're in. So usually GI tract. And usually vertebrates are the de definitive host. All right, the adults, digenetic trematodes, uh, usually have two suckers. Usually have two suckers. The oral sucker is the one that possesses the mouth, hence the name oral sucker. The acetabulum is the ventral sucker. Right, or the ventral sucker is called the acetabulum. They're synonyms. We're going to avoid opus after for these guys. The size and shape, size and shape in our, uh, of our worms is highly variable. We're going to have some that are millimeters in length, one to two millimeters, if that. Uh, and we have some that are several centimeters. You've seen one in zoology. You saw fasciola. It's a couple centimeters in size. The overall shape can be round, could be leaf-like, could be ribbon-like. All right, so just highly uh, variable form, by forms.
There it is. Oh, uh, did you get? Did you get that? You ready? All right. So most of our worms are monoecious, which means. What does that mean? They have, no, they have both sexes in the body. Both sexes in the same body. So, hermaphroditic worms. Right? And I had it up here. They contain both male and female organs. Right? And we've seen this. We've, we saw this in the lab and the worms that we looked at. All right? Their life cycles are complex, indirect life cycles. So, they're going to be multi-host. Almost all of them utilize a mollusk as the first intermediate host. They're usually a snail, but sometimes a clam or mussel. So usually a snail, I should say usually a gastropod, sometimes bivalves. Like almost all of them, I, I don't know of any that don't. But almost all kind of catches us because again, we've got a lot of worms that haven't been described. And in our complex life cycle, we're going to have anywhere from two hosts to four hosts in our life cycle. Ready? All right. These guys, whoops, oops, I'm on, I'm on the wrong, I see the cursor on the screen. That's not on my actual screen. All right, so the holdfasts for these guys are the suckers. All right, so the holdfasts are what they're going to use to attach and, and hang on uh, in, their, in the intestine usually or where, wherever they're at, or they use these for movement. All right, so they're suckers, and usually we have two suckers. All right. You have oral sucker and then eventually located acetabulum. Now, the position of that acetabulum is going to vary among species, and its location then gives us a different term for that body form. All right, so your classic oral sucker, ventral sucker, like in this example, is a diastome. It got its name because when people were first describing them, they thought these suckers had a mouth in it. So two mouths is what, what they thought. We know that that's not true. If that acetabulum is at the posterior end of the worm, then it's called an amphistome. Can't be for both. Both ends. Both mouths, you could say. All right, so you have the oral sucker, and then you have a posterior ventral sucker. So a posterior uh, acetabulum. And then some have lost their ventral sucker. It's thought that these are actually derived. So they had a ventral sucker at one point, and then they lost it. These are called the monostomes. Mono for one, one mouth. So we've got these three different body forms. Diastome, amphistome, monostome. The adult worms often have spines on their tegument. It's thought that these spines aid the worm in remaining positioned in the intestine. I think we kind of talked about it. If you have backward, backward facing spines and you position yourself against the flow, those spines are going to help resist movement down that gut. Some of the spines are large, some of them are really, really tiny. So we do have a, a worm where we can look at the you zoom in at like the 40x on the edge of the tegument to see some of these spines. Ready? So our tegument is syncytial. So see the introduction to the platy helmets. This is a different diagram of our syncytial tegument. But just as a reminder, we have this anucleate layer out at the surface. The anucleate layer out at the surface. You've got these internuncial spaces, internuncial canals, that lead down to the cell bodies, the cytons. 
right? So your your uh, production secretory compounds, your mitochondria, all located down here, and then you've got your vesicles that lead out to the surface. So you dump dump items, secretory products. All right. Now on these worms, we have this glycocalyx, which is essentially a living plasma membrane that's interspersed with protein-rich elements. All right, so there's our definition of a glycocalyx. We introduced it. Here's our formal definition. This layer is constantly shed. And if it's constantly shed, it's continuously renewed. So we just have a constant production in our cytons to replenish this glycocalyx. All right, the reason it, it's doing this probably in response to host damage. So the host immune system is fighting this thing. Antibodies are binding. You have uh, the innate response coming in, dumping uh, proteolytic contents right against the surface, trying to break it down. It gets damaged, it gets shed, and you've got fresh new glycocalyx replacing it. All right. And I'm going to point out, since... These guys do have a mouth. They're going to have an intestine. All right, they can acquire food and nutrition just by feeding, but they also absorb some of their nutrients across their tegument. So to help them do this, along our surface, you have these invaginations, surface invaginations, that serve to increase the surface area. You can make a note at this stage uh, to see the cestode tegument, because their cestode tegument is going to be different. Our cestodes lack a mouth. They lack intestines. So we're going to see it's slightly a different tegument structure, still syncytial, but a different structure that really increases our surface area. All right. All right, so we have a mouth, which means we have a digestion, digestive system. The arrangement of the digestive tract is pretty simple. You have your mouth. Usually you have a prepharynx, which is just that short spot between the mouth opening and the pharynx itself. And then you have an esophagus. Could be very, very minuscule. Could be quite long. The esophagus goes to the cecia, which you know, tend, to, tend to branch off of that esophagus into two sides, two cecia. All right, just like this, this generic diagram of generalized internal anatomy. Here, you've got your mouth, it's in the oral sucker, you've got a very short prepharynx, your pharynx, a somewhat short esophagus, and then you've got the two intestinal cecia that extend the length of the worm. It's in the platy helminths, we have a blind gut, so no anus on here. Food is acquired or pulled into the gut through or via the pharynx, or the, the work of the pharynx. The pharynx is very muscular, and when we see this in our slides, we can see the striations of the pharynx. Maybe not all the striations, depending on, on how well it's stained. Depends on how well it's stained. But the pharynx is large, it's kind of ball-shaped, it's right, right, right located near the oral sucker. All right, It's going to suck food in, and by sucking food in, it's also going to push and force food down the esophagus into the cecia. Or cecia. Right. So that's how they feed. But note, we also have nutrient uptake via absorption through the tegument as well. So nutrient acquisition isn't limited to just absorption. It isn't limited to just feeding, you know, ingestion of, of compounds. We've got both that can occur. And they do occur. Ready? The excretory and osmoregulatory system, um, it's flame cells. You have the flame cell system, but the entire system uh, is a combination of processes. So we do have diffusion through the surface. So you've got diffusion of nutrients inside the worm, and you have a diffusion of waste outside the worm, you could say. We also have diffusion back into the intestinal cecae because any waste that's remaining that can't be absorbed is going to have to be regurgitated and expelled. All right. 
the like, solid waste kind of gets expelled. Then we have the flame cell system. All right, so the flame cell system is primarily osmoregulatory, all right, but it will expel some nitrogenous wastes. Our flame cell system is fairly extensive in our worms. The, the more life cycle stage is inside a hypotonic solution, the more developed and more active the system will be because we'll have the influx of water and we have to get rid of it. So with our flame cell system, you have these individual branches, flame cells at each end, you have your collecting ducts that then join up to collecting tubules, and they normally go down to an excretory bladder. So in this case, this ex excretory bladder is Y-shaped, but it doesn't have to be Y-shaped. Sometimes it's just more oval where the tubules go in at one end. All right? There's a lot of variation. And then that excretory bladder empties to the outside via an excretory pore. Typically, this is in the posterior end of the worm. We have it in our generalized diagram. We have our excretory bladder, but we did not list the flame cells or the flame cell system on that diagram because it was showing more of the reproductive system. Our primary waste product for these guys is ammonia. Why is that? Why not something like urea, urea, or uric acid? Those are the other two. Why, why ammonia? From ecology, do you already forget? Is water abundant, so it cycles it through. Yeah, so it gets cleared out. So ammonia is toxic, right? Mm -hmm. Ammonia is highly toxic. Uh, ammonia is also a cheap excretory product. All right, you're in a place where that just gets washed away repeatedly. You're in almost like a constantly flowing system, if you think about these worms in, in the intestine. So yeah, you can get rid of ammonia uh, and not really worry about it uh, being toxic, toxic to us. All right. There's my cursor. There we go. All right, our reproductive systems. We're going to break it down into the male system and the female system, and we're going to have a bunch of definitions. So the male reproductive system follows this general pattern. We have our testes. They're going to produce the sperm. When they get, get produced, the sperm are going to travel down the vas efferens. And then the vas efferens will join up into the vas deferens. Vas deferens leads to the seminal vesicle. The prostate gland, it'll pass by the prostate gland. It goes to, through the serous, so our ejaculatory duct, which we left off, but it goes through the serous and then out the genital pore. And the serous can be averted because that is our protrusible sperm transfer organ. Our serous is protrusible. Its role is to transfer sperm. The serous sac is what holds the serous when it's inverted. So in our generalized diagram, we have our testes, two testes down here. We have our vas efferens lead from our testes. I think I use this. So two testes, we have our vas efferens leads from each testes, and then when they join up, now we have the vas deferens, we get to the seminal vesicle, prostate gland, the serous is, in, is, is inverted in the sac, uh, mostly. There is a small protrusion of the serous right there, but it's coming out through the genital pore. And this is, in this case, it's a shared genital pore. If you've had anatomy, very similar structures and names. Vas efferens, vas deferens, everything. Ready? 
Female reproductive system is a bit more complicated. <clears throat> and I think we had this kind of in the lab as we were trying to figure out where these things, wh where do they connect. So in the female system, we've got the ovary and we have the vital area. Right, those are the two things that, that will be there. They're going to start. The ovary produces the eggs, or the ovum. And that ova is going to travel down the oviduct. The vitellaria is uh, the structure, that, these glandular structures that produce substances, these globules, that travel down the vitellin duct and connect to the oviduct. So you've got your ova coming from the ovary, you have the vitellin follicle, follicle, the vitellin globules traveling down the vitellin duct to get to the overduct. And then when they get there, they can join up. All right, and I have definitions for all, all of these things kind of laying out. I want you to get this order. The overduct can also have two other structures attached to it. Seminal receptacle, receptacle, so it'll be a, a sperm storage organ, and it opens up to the overduct. And Lars canal, which is... Not in every worm, it's considered vestigial, it's just kind of a blind duct, may store sperm, but that can also open to the oviduct. All right, so you've got the ova, ovum coming from the ovary, you've got the vitellin globules coming from the vitel area, and now you have sperm coming from the seminal receptacle and or the large canal, all going into the oviduct, they all join up in the, in the oatype. All right, so the oatype, it's going to be where we have our, our fertilization. That oatype is surrounded by Malus's gland. Malus's gland is going to se secrete some substances that may aid in eggshell formation, but probably it helps to lubricate the eggs because now our fertilized ova travels into the uterus, and as it's traveling through the uterus, the eggshell hardens, the, the embryo matures, and whatnot. All right, so the uterus is going to be usually the largest structure uh, largest part of, of, the fe of the female worm, usually. There are, there are exceptions. I think fasciola is one. Uh, 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 um, Paragonimus is the one that you'll see. It's actually pretty small. But you have your eggs traveling down the uterus. This one, very much simplified. And then it gets to the metroterm. The metroterm is essentially a muscular, uh, muscular structure, the muscular end of the uterus. It functions as both like a vagina, where the sera, where it can kind of grasp onto the serous while sperm gets delivered, but it also keeps the eggs from just, just dumping out, all right? So muscular clo closure, and, and then it opens at the genital pore. So that's a generalized structure. And here's our definitions. So seminal receptacle, its function, store sperm. Lawyer's Canal. It's a blind duct, usually. Uh, or it can open at the surface. So in our worm, it's blind. It doesn't open at the surface. It's likely, if people think it's a vestigial vagina, that that's where the serous would have, would have entered it to uh, transfer sperm. But it's probably not non-functional. Now, when the sperm uh, get deposited, they have to go through the uterus just to get to that ootype. The Lorius canal could store sperm as well. The vitellaria or the vitellin glands, they supply nutrients for the yolk and substrates that will become the eggshell. This is our ectolocythal or however it's pronounced. All right. Good. Yes. Oh, a type. This is where the eggs are fertilized. Eggshell formation also starts here. 
Mayless's gland actually has an unknown function. We, we still don't know exactly what it does. But based on its structure, it looks it's glandular in nature. The, the ultrastructure looks glandular. So uh, perhaps it could secrete adhesives for the vitiline globules. So the globules kind of come to the ova. They, they have to be able to stick. Maybe secretions from the Mayless gland help that to, to happen, uh, allow them to stick and stay together. Uh, and then they could, they could then start forming the eggshell or contribute to eggshell formation. Or perhaps these secretions are all about lubricating the outside of the egg. So as it's traveling through the uterus, they can actually travel and they don't get stuck and, and you don't get blockage. In our lab with the structures, uh, we can't distinguish between malus gland and ootype. So if I ask what's the structure, normally just answer oatype. If I ask what's the structure and what's the gland that surrounds the structure, then when I ask the gland, now you know it's malus gland. All right, but we can't just we can't we can't separate them. It's surrounding. Um, and then our metric term, that's a muscular end of the uterus. All right, its function is an ovejector and a vagina. So egg ejector and the vagina. Ooh, yeah, got a question. Hopefully that helps. I forget. All right. Life cycle. Always indirect. It's always going to be indirect. Always multi-host. And the Digenea got its name because we're going to have sexual reproduction and we're going to see asexual reproduction. So for our Digeneans, sexual reproduction occurs in our definitive host. That's part of our definition of a definitive host. Our asexual reproduction is going to occur in our intermediate host, not any intermediate host, but in our first intermediate host, in that mollusk. Who would just sit in on a class that, whatever. I got someone watching that's not even in this class, but why, why do that? Anyways, asexual reproduction is in the first intermediate host. It's reproductive, it's reproduction isn't like joining of the gametes or anything, it's polyembryony. All right, so you're gonna have this germ cell that just cleaves and, and reproduces. So what we end up happening is that you have an egg coming down, gets into the snail, and that one egg can then produce hundreds of thousands of this next larval stage. What do you think the benefit is of that? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, the more we make, the more likely it is that we're going to get to that next host. All right? And that is an idea for transmission. We'll probably end, end the semester talking about transmission and how do we, how we, uh, the mathematical description of transmission. But it's, it's pretty simple. All right? So we'll use COVID as the example since it's been in the news so much. All right? If it was just me and one student in this class and one of us had COVID, the chance that we would transmit it to that other person is going to be pretty small. All right? It's one-on-one. -on -one. We had to get close enough. We had to, I don't know, breathe on, on that person. All right? But if you have one individual and you have this entire class and one individual is infected, the chance that another one gets infected is going to be pretty high. All right? So that relies on the host. The flip side of it is if I cough once, I expel a certain number of particles chance that you encounter those particles is going to be slow. But if I cough 
hundreds of times and just keep expelling clouds of it, clouds of it, I'm increasing the number of particles that increases the rupture rate of transmission. That's essentially what these guys are doing. That's, that's that rule of the asexual reproduction. We're trying to produce so many that we increase our chance that we can find our way back to the vertebrate host. And if we're utilizing intermediate host, sometimes we have to, we have to really be aware that going from one to the next and then getting to that last jump is going to be extremely unlikely. But we can offset that by just sheer numbers. All right? Now, once we do get into our snail host, there's going to be much variation in what, what we exhibit. So I have a description here. We have our adult. It's our generalized life cycle. The egg starts with the egg. The egg hatches, releases a myrcidium. That's our first larval stage. That myrcidium inside a snail will transform into a sporocyst. All right? Sporocyst reproduces. Some transform into a redium. Radia reproduce, secrete, they release cercaria. That's our pre living stage. Cercaria infect the host, perhaps, or they insist, where they are now metacercaria. And these metacercaria find, get their way to the definitive host where we have the adult. So, our generalized life cycle, I'm going to include all of these stages, but there's a lot of variation. So, what we know is that the sporocyst, the mere city, will develop into a sporocyst. That sporocyst, that mother sporocyst, can reproduce to produce more sporocysts. Usually that happens. And then those first generation sporocysts, those daughter sporocysts, can produce cercaria that step. Sometimes that mother sporocyst reproduces, produces daughter sporocysts, which then reproduce to produce a redia, and those redia then produce cercaria. Other times we get our sporocysts, reproduce the daughter sporocysts, they produce media called now called mother media, which then reproduce to produce daughter media, and those daughter media produce cercaria. Or we have our sporocysts reproduces to produce the mother media that reproduce to produce her daughter media, and then the cercaria. So there's a lot of variation in this step. Now for us, we don't have to know every single stage or what it's going to be doing. We're not going to distinguish between mother and daughter sporosis and mother and daughter redia. What we're going to be concerned with is what is producing the cercaria. Is it redia that's producing them or is it going to be sporocysts? So in our life cycles, we'll stay, we'll kind of give the overview and say, okay, it's the redia that are producing the cercaria or sporosis is the cercarial producing stage. So let's look at these larval stages. So that first larval stage coming out of the egg is the myrcidium. Right. Myrcidium is a ciliated free-swimming larval stage of the digenea. So unlike the cotylocidium that had ciliary tufts, these guys are completely covered in cilia. Their function? For, to move. The cilia's function is for movement. These cilia arise from six plates on the surface. So if we uh, digest the cilia, you will see six plates on the surface of these myrcidia. And that's the exterior. The interior doesn't have a whole lot. But what it does have uh, is a germ cell, or germ cells. And th that germinal mass it's what gives rise to our sporocysts. Right. You also have some apical glands. You can have some apical glands, especially if they're used in penetration and, and whatnot. We're, we don't have examples of these. We're not going to know the, the overall structures. We just need to know a definition that distinguishes a myrcidium from a cotylocidium from a, an oncomyrcidium and a corocidium. All right? So myrcidium, pretty small. Sporocysts are germinal sacs. There's no mouth to them. All of their nutrients gets absorbed across the tegument. All right, and that's really what separates sporocysts from redia. We don't have a mouth for sporocysts. All of our nutrients are absorbed. These sporocysts can produce other sporocysts. They can produce redia, or they can produce cercaria. But 
The catch is an individual can only produce one type. So an individual can't produce all three. So when you have a mother spore cyst, the mother spore cyst will only produce daughter spore cysts. The daughter spore cysts then only produce cercaria. And the trigger, kind of unknown, but it's, suspe it's suspected that the transition, the trigger, uh, could be, um, just could be programmed. So it's genetically programmed. Mother spore cysts always produce daughter spore cysts. Daughter spore cysts always produce cercaria. So that is just fixed. Or perhaps there is the daughter spore cysts will produce, some of those will also produce other spore cysts. And then once you hit a population density inside the worm, all of a sudden some of them, the next generation realizes that it's filled, I'm going to start producing cercaria. It's a good question, big question. All right, so here's just a generic diagram. Usually the ones that we find in our snails, our sporocysts tend to be longer and thinner, thread-like. Our slides of sporocysts and redia also tend to be more longer and thread-like. But we have, in this one, we have our cercaria uh, developing. Uh, cercaria are released through a birth pore um, in these sporocysts, and it's highly unlikely that we would see a birth pore. Ready? Redia. Redia have a mouth, a pharynx, and a blind gut. So it's going to acquire its nutrients through consumption of host tissue. All right, it's still a germinal structure. It's still going to be producing either redia or cercaria, and again, it's only ever going to produce one type. Right? So that part's somewhat similar to sporocysts. They can't produce sporocysts, but they can produce cercaria. But now these guys are actively feeding. They're feeding on the host tissue, which can have negative effects on that host. When some of these, they end up getting into the gonads of the snail. They consume the high-energy gonads. And because they're consuming the high-energy gonads, now that snail can't reproduce. It's still, it's still allocating energy to regenerate those structures, but the parasite's just consuming them. So that can have important uh, population consequences. These are some diagrams. You can see the pharynx right at the top. Usually the pharynx is rather large. It's pulling in a lot of this and tearing a lot of the snail tissue. So our pharynx is right at the top, and then you've got your, your gut that tends to be a little bit darker in color because it has snail tissue that's being broken down. And then you have your developing cercaria that are inside. And like the sporocysts, cercaria are born through a birth pore. Yep. Yeah, they, so they vary in size. They vary in size. Um, there is some suggestion that these guys don't only eat, consume snail tissue, but they could consume another species of parasite's tissue. So we can, you know, some people have, have looked and set up a hierarchy that said, if you get infected with, you get infected with a sporocyst type parasite, all right? Sporocysts are producing cercaria. They're going to produce those cercaria until it gets infected with one of these guys. And then once the reedy appear, they will chow down on the sporocysts and exclude them. So, like, the end result is you, you get, once you get these, that's it. But it's not just based on size. Sometimes they have smaller ones that actively go after uh, other parasites. And some of the large, but those smaller ones, sometimes you see them producing cercaria. Sometimes the larger ones produce cercaria. My hope is that in, in the next week or two, uh, I can find some snails that are infected that we can look at some of these. But water's kind of cold out there right now. All right. Cercaria. Uh, cercaria are the larval stage. It's usually free swimming, usually free swimming. They're going to be produced by sporocystoridia. 
and they're being shed from our mollusk intermediate host. Right. Now there's much variability. So I say they are usually free swimming because all of these examples, they have tails. And they swim in the water column. But not all of them need to have a tail, or some of the tails are modified into other structures. So they could be some that are insisted, or they look like they're insisted. So there's a lot of variation just in, in the tails, but they are usually free swimming. Uh, and then just in the morphology, they're gonna, you're going to see a lot of variation in sizes, shapes, uh, suckers. Normally, if you're a diastome, the cercaria are diastomes. If you're an amphistome, the cercaria are, are amphistomes and so forth. But these guys can have eye spots, while where the adults do not. They can have spines. You could have a stylet, which is located on on the inside of the oral sucker, which it uses to kind of scratch the exoskeletons to help aid in penetration. All right, you can have body fin folds, you can have tail fin folds, uh, you've got your different types of uh, excretory bladder, so real thin wall versus more cellular wall. There's a lot of variation, a lot of things. Uh, all right, and then terminology, the naming of these things kind of follow what structures they possess. Fortunately, usually cercaria types follow at least at the family level. So if you find one of these guys, they're probably in the same family as the second one that you find. Doesn't always apply, but, but often, usually. When you have these guys, it's hard to get them to species. It's hard to get them to species. All right. So these are swimmers. They have active energy. What energy source? They use glycogen, and that has important consequences. And we'll, I think we'll pick this up on Monday. All right? We'll pick this up on Monday. We'll finish this, the life cycle stuff, and then we will get to platyhelminth diversity and probably go over at least one life cycle before our lab. All right? All right. Enjoy the weekend.